None of us is immune to criticism. Well, except me. Okay, that was pretty good. I think you can do better. Why don't we get a second one with a little more energy? <laughs> Video game developers aren't immune to the slings and arrows of outrageous critics either, and while most choose to take negative feedback on board, or alternatively, ignore it entirely, others choose a third way, dunking on their haters in public where everyone can see it. Here are seven times video games made fun of their haters. Enjoy! Unless you're a hater. Overall, your game is on a good path, I think. Good luck with it, and best regards, Raphael. The Stanley Parable is a bizarre conceptual office simulator in which an omnipresent narrator spends the whole game making you feel vaguely inferior. At this point, Stanley's obsession with this room bordered on creepy and reflected poorly on his overall personality. It's possible that this is why everyone left. Right, like that. But no one has been made to feel quite as inferior by the Stanley Parable as one particular player named Raphael, who played the game and then sent an email to the development team with some less than complimentary thoughts. Thoughts that the developers then turned into an entire new trailer for the game called the Raphael Trailer. I recently received an email from a man named Raphael who writes, I just played your game, and I'd like to say it was the most annoying thing I ever played. In this trailer, the game's narrator reads Raphael's email in a stupid voice over some comedy part-part music, highlighting such moments as Raphael's complaints about its lack of emotion. It's a very emotionless game. His claims that he couldn't do anything. People play games because of what they can do inside them, and your game is very good at letting them know they can't do anything. Wondering if any women play it. I ask because they are blissfully less logical than us guys. And his complaints about the narrator saying Stanley all the time. And that Stanley is repeated all the time by the narrator. This breathtaking owning continues with the narrator saying they've now discarded the Stanley parable based on Raphael's feedback and rebuilt it from the ground up with a new emotional story and emotion booths for feeling emotions. The game's central feature, emotion booths. Stepping into any one of these booths will cause the player to actually feel that emotion. And these are just some of the hundreds of thousands of emotions you'll find in the final game. And the ability to do literally anything. In this scenario, the player has just infused a bicycle with the soul of his great-great-great-uncle Hermophrodes. From this point, he might use Hermophrodes' ethereal presence to detect nearby mineral deposits or perhaps he might train the bicycle in the art of undoing temporal paradoxes. Ah, it seems that the player has chosen to use the haunted bicycle to deceive townsfolk as a part of his snake oil salesman ruse. How bold. He then cites reviews from a woman. While a woman writes, This place has shoes. I love shoes. Oh my god. Shopping, 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 shopping. Before finishing by saying Stanley as much as possible to piss Raphael off. <coughs> Stanley, 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 Stanley. Best of all, if you type Raphael into the game's console command in the actual game, it activates Raphael mode, in which the narrator just repeats the name Stanley over and over again. Stanley. Stanley. I'm guessing Raphael isn't eagerly awaiting the Stanley parable too. A brotherhood initiate enters this troubled town. The mission begins simply. Establish contact with a group of Brotherhood Paladins. But in the Wasteland, nothing is ever that easy. Fallout Brotherhood of Steel was the fourth Fallout game, and the final one made by Interplay, just before the franchise moved over to Bethesda. Was that because Brotherhood of Steel was terrible? I mean, take a look at this gameplay and decide for yourself. Oh yeah, Fallout 76 is looking real good about now, huh? Given Brotherhood of Steel's departure from the established Fallout tone, gameplay and lore, there were many die-hard Fallout fans who were anxious about the game during development, and who voiced their concerns online in several Fallout fan forums because this was 2004, and that was the sort of thing people did back then. What did the developers of Fallout Brotherhood of Steel do with this wealth of fan feedback? Take it on board and adjust the game accordingly? Ignore it and trust that their years of experience making video games would lead to a product that would end up pleasing those fans anyway. Or, wildcard third option, laugh at everything on those forums and then put a line in the end credits of their game telling everyone that they did that. 
Yes, Brotherhood of Steel's end credits, which are of course only viewable by those who finish the game, aka the most hardcore and dedicated Fallout fans, include a line shouting out two of the most prominent Fallout fan forums, duckandcover.net and nmafallout.com, along with a line of text saying, thanks for the laughs. Good thing Brotherhood of Steel was a stone cold classic to back up those words, hey? Haha, <laughs> <laughs> man. Thank you for the last Fallout Brotherhood of Steel. Guacamelee is a Metroidvania-style side-scrolling brawler that's almost as dedicated to memes as it is to you running about the place punching skeletons. While many people enjoyed Guacamelee's meme-forward presentation, there were plenty of other players who found it tired or cringy or unimaginative and weren't shy about sharing that opinion online. Guacamelee developers Drinkbox even agreed, saying in a post-mortem on game site Gamma Sutra that the memes may have gone too far. And then they went and released Guacamelee 2, which was just as meme and included an entire bonus stage dedicated to dunking on people who had a problem with it in the first game. Called the Dank Cave, this area is littered with meme posters and catchphrases, but also populated by skeletons whose dialogue is entirely made up of verbatim forum posts from people complaining about the memes in the first Guacamelee game. Make no mistake, there are a lot of people with meme grievances in this cave. And they're not afraid to let you know about them. Eventually, you reach the end of the cave where an incredulous goat wonders at how you could possibly have made it through a cave with nine memes in it. You know, I'm beginning to think that Drinkbox likes memes. You know, you can just look at memes, Drinkbox. You don't have to make games as well. Just, just look at them. The main criticism levelled at the Souls series of ultra-hard RPGs is, of course, that The Onion Knight is not romanceable. Whatever can be done. The second main criticism is that it's too hard. Because, let's face it, these games are extremely hard. Of course, the difficulty in Souls games is a big part of the point. These are games that reward patience, practice and perseverance, qualities that tend to be optional in most other video games. As such, you can imagine the Souls team at From Software coming to the conclusion that those levelling this criticism at their game simply didn't understand what it was about, and then continued on their merry way making inviting looking treasure chests that can kill you. But the FromSoft folks couldn't resist adding a little dig at these detractors in Dark Souls 2, in the form of an achievement, most likely the first achievement you'll get in the game. It's awarded for dying for the first time and it's called This Is Dark Souls, making it very clear that dying over and over again is what the game is about. I mean, I think I had figured that out already, Dark Souls, but thanks for the reminder. Reviews are irrelevant for Pokemon games because for most Pokemon players the only thing you need to know is one, are there Pokemon in it, and two, can you catch them all? 
However, that doesn't stop games media outlets from attempting to assign a numerical score to a new Pokemon game, as plucky upstart video game website The Imagine Games Network, or IGN for short, did to Pokemon Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire for the 3DS in 2014. IGN's review was broadly positive, scoring it 7.8 out of 10, citing its needed updates and gorgeous presentation, but criticising it for having, quote, too much water despite it being set in Hoenn, a region made up of islands. Pokemon fans being normal, they allowed this subjective opinion to pass without comment as they busied themselves enjoying the game that they enjoyed. Haha, <laughs> psych! Actually, they roasted the reviewer senseless, and 7.8 out of 10, too much water, became a huge sarcastic meme. So huge, in fact, that this meme eventually made its way back into the series that inspired it in Pokemon Sun and Moon for the 3DS. A new feature introduced in Sun and Moon, the Poke Finder, let you take pictures of Pokemon, which would then be uploaded to a social media account where in-game Poke fans would comment on your pics. If you took a picture on the beach with the sea in the background, however, you stood a chance of getting this infamous comment on your pic. I mean, to be fair, the ocean is a lot of water. They're not wrong. So, what happened to Jeff? He was praising my leadership when he just collapsed. Uh, Dark Queen, you look different than I remember. At the height of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles popularity in the early 1990s, we had all kinds of off-brand turtle knockoffs. There were the biker mice from Mars, the samurai pizza cats, the street sharks, and the Wild West cowboys of Moo Mesa, which incredibly, I am not making up. Into this radical animal mix, you can also add the Battletoads, punchy frogs created in 1991 by game developer Rare to star in a side-scrolling beat-em-up for the NES. In Battletoads, you played as Rash or Zitz, trying to rescue both a princess and a third toad named after a skin condition, Pimple. They've been kidnapped by the game's main villain, the Dark Queen, a woman who looks like she's stopped by an Elvira lookalike contest on her way to a night out at Torture Garden. Throughout Battletoads, the Dark Queen would pop up to mock you and to throw obstacles in your way, from tough as nails bosses to famously unfair hoverbike sections. Before you finally defeated her once and for all in the game's final boss fight. Battletoads made a surprise comeback in 2020 with a sequel, also called Battletoads, in which the fighty frogs emerge from a virtual reality bunker in which they've been imprisoned for 26 years, and set out to defeat their old nemesis, the Dark Queen, only to end up teaming up with her to defeat an evil alien race called the Topians. Your Majesties? Yes, mortal. Moments ago, we received this transmission. This Dark Queen, you'll notice, has a much more low-key dress sense, opting for purple robes instead of her previous dominatrix-inspired garb, something that clearly upset certain sections of the video game community prior to Battletoads' release. Or at least that's how it looks based on this interaction in the game, in which Jeff, a former acquaintance of the Queen, remarks on her new outfit, You know what? One more thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it absolutely has to be said. This new outfit? <laughs> and then is booted out of the ship's airlock. Oh my God, oh my God. Tell me the location of the secret entrance! <laughs> and if you're in any doubt, the Queen then goes on to spell it out for you. I guess we've changed, Jeff. I've grown more impatient and you want to control what I'm wearing. Like you're entitled to it because we hung out 20 years ago. So I think Jeff, and by extension, the Battletoads haters moaning about the Queen's outfit, learned a powerful lesson here about- <laughs> Oh, she dropped him. I mean, I for one love the outfit. Just thought I'd mention that. There is no other choice. You must join Smash. Huh? Join Smash Brothers already! What in the world are you waiting for? Smash Brothers is an ingeniously simple idea for a video game. What if all of Nintendo's most beloved characters got together and had a big fight? And yes, the answer is, of course, Luigi would die. A fighting game is only as strong as its roster, and that's where Nintendo excels, with decades of great games to draw characters from, leading to a massive lineup of beloved characters like the Mario Brothers, Link and Zelda, many Pokemon, and even guest characters from other developers, such as Ryu and Ken from Street Fighter, Sonic the Hedgehog, and ugh, stop trying to make me's happen, Nintendo. 
While some of these guest characters make sense for a fighting tournament, like Kazuya from Tekken or Snake from Metal Gear Solid, some disgruntled fans have noticed more than a few sword-wielding characters from Japanese RPGs starting to make their way into the Smash Bros roster, such as Marth from Fire Emblem, Shulk from Xenoblade Chronicles, Cloud from Final Fantasy VII, and Hero from Dragon Quest XI. Despite these sword-based characters making up a clear minority of characters in Smash Bros, Nintendo are clearly aware of the Too Many Swordsmen complaint as they directly referenced it in the Super Smash Bros Ultimate reveal trailer for new character Byleth, himself a swordsman from the game Fire Emblem Three Houses. The trailer begins with Byleth being dispatched to the Smash Bros tournament where he apparently gets his ass handed to him because he returns in a sorry state, at which point the diagnosis is made that the game contains too many swordsmen. So you return, and sooner than expected. I see. Too many swordsmen are there? And you? You wield the sword as well? What will you do? And as they say, he wields a sword too. So this is basically Nintendo saying, yeah, we're adding another JRPG character to Smash Brothers, and we'd love to know just what it is you plan on doing about it. Through Smash, show the world! Continue to play and love Smash Brothers. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Hi, uh, yes, there you have it. Byleth from Fire Emblem Three Houses is joining the battle. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video about games that made fun of their haters. Of course, I love all my haters. I take all their feedback on board and I allow it to let me grow and get better as a creator. So thank you to the haters. All you're doing is making me stronger. Yeah, that was pretty good. Can we get one more outro? I didn't really fit. Oh no, he's crying again. <laughs> Please watch another video. Oh no. The lights aren't even working. <laughs>